Hi, I'm Brianna, and this is Decoding Physiology, a series from Decoding DX where we focus on understanding the why behind various clinical pathophysiologies so that we can understand for the long term and better make decisions for our patients. Today we're going to be talking about renal tubular acidosis. So to start out, a quick reminder of the tree of metabolic acidosis. We have the anion gap side and the non-anion gap side. Today, we're going to be focusing on the non-anion gap side with the renal loss of bicarbonate, which is caused by various different renal tubular acidoses. But before we dive into RTAs, it's important to realize that kidney issues are on both sides of this tree, with both the anion gap and non-anion gap side. So it's really important to understand the differences between these two etiologies. In renal tubular acidosis, there's some sort of problem in the actual tubular cells handling of bicarbonate or acid. Whereas in kidney failure, the overall number of nephrons is just reduced, but the healthy nephrons remaining still are able to handle the bicarbonate and acid like they would otherwise. Now, it's important to know that oftentimes there will be overlap between these two. So in order to just learn them and distinguish them, we're talking about them on the two extremes or isolated parts of the spectrum where they're not overlapping. In RTA, the GFR is gonna be unchanged, but in kidney failure, it's gonna be reduced. And typically we don't even see metabolic acidosis from kidney failure until the GFR is below about 40. In RTA, the metabolic anions themselves are going to be excreted, whereas in kidney failure, the whole etiology is that they're retained proportionally to GFR. The anion gap will generally be normal in a renal tubular acidosis, but it will be elevated in kidney failure, again, because the issue is that we're accumulating excess acids in kidney failure, whereas the issue in RTA is mishandling of bicarbonate. Quick reminder of the daily acid load. This is the amount of acid that's normally produced in our bodies from just normal metabolism, a lot of that coming from amino acid metabolism. This produces about one millimole per keg per day of excess acid that has to be buffered by an equivalent amount of bicarbonate. That bicarbonate consumption is one of the key issues that comes up with renal tubular acidosis, so that's what we're going to be focusing on. That bicarbonate is critical to be recycled, but one millimole per keg per day is consumed to buffer that daily acid load. How is that recycled though? Two main processes in the kidney. In step one, the proximal tubule is going to reabsorb all of the bicarbonate that is filtered. Again, in a healthy nephron, all of the bicarbonate that comes through the glomerulus is going to be reabsorbed. And then in the distal nephron, extra bicarbonate is going to be produced to replace that one millimole per keg per day. Again, this is in a healthy nephron. So to start with, let's talk about step one in the proximal tubule. What if that reabsorption is broken? So this is a proximal RTA. This comes from something affecting the ability of the proximal convoluted tubule to reabsorb that bicarb. So this step is off. And generally it's not selective to just bicarb. So we're gonna have an impaired reabsorption of all sorts of nutrients that are filtered into the PCT. One of the main results from this is that you have excess bicarbonate that's delivered to the distal nephron, created an excess amount of negative charge in the lumen compared to the cells in the DCT, or distal convoluted tubule. This creates an excess electrical gradient, which then attracts potassium down that gradient into the lumen, leading to excess potassium wasting. In addition, we talked earlier about how many things are not reabsorbed well. That includes sodium. And we know that water follows sodium, so if we waste a bunch of sodium, we're going to be wasting a lot of water, which will lead to a stimulation of aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to trigger the sodium-potassium pumps in the tubule, leading to even more potassium wasting into the lumen. This is commonly called Fanconi syndrome, which is different from Fanconi disease, but Fanconi syndrome is any sort of diffuse wasting of nutrients from the proximal convoluted tubule. This leads to wasting of anything from glucose to amino acids to phosphate and can be caused by many different things. There is a genetic defect that will cause this, but many other more common issues like multiple myeloma in various different toxicities can cause a Fanconi syndrome type picture. So what about if the distal nephron isn't working, if that part of the creation of new bicarb is not working? This leads to a distal RTA. The general issue of a distal RTA is impaired urine acidification, which equals bicarbonate production. So I know this is a busy slide, so we'll take it one piece at a time. This is in a normal functioning nephron. We have sodium delivered to the lumen, and the principal cell then reabsorbs that sodium, leading to a negative charge relative to the cell in the lumen. The sodium-potassium pump then helps create this gradient so that the sodium can continue to be reabsorbed. Then in the intercalated cell, there's a hydrogen pump that pumps excess hydrogen ion into the lumen. 
This process is directly related to production of new bicarbonate. You can see the chemical reaction there in the intercalated cell. So the pumping out of hydrogen is directly related to creating new bicarbonate to replace the daily acid load that we lost, that one millimole per cake per day. And then the lumen walls are impermeable to that hydrogen ion so that it stays in the urine and is excreted. There are a couple different steps here that can be impaired that would lead to a renal tubular acidosis. So starting with step one, if that sodium is not able to be reabsorbed, this is called a voltage dependent distal RTA. This leads to the loss of that electrical gradient from the negative charge in the lumen because we're not reabsorbing that sodium. This also impairs the ability for the ATPase to pump hydrogen. It partially requires that gradient. And what we talked about earlier is that the hydrogen is directly related to the production of new bicarbonate. So if we impair the ability to pump out hydrogen, we also impair the production of new bicarbonate. This also means that potassium is no longer attracted into the lumen as much as it was, leading to a hyperkalemia. So main characteristics for a voltage-dependent distal RTA, you'll obviously have the acidemia, and in general, you'll have a urine pH that's elevated because you're not pumping out that extra acid. You'll have the hyperkalemia because there's not that attraction of the potassium to normally get into the lumen, and you'll also generally have a hypovolemia because you're not absorbing the sodium, which was the initial problem to begin with. There's lots of things that could cause this. One of the more common ones is an obstructive uropathy. So something like BPH or a big stone or something else that is blocking the urine output causing black flow in kidney injury. But what if that sodium resorption is still intact? Well, then we can get a classical distal RTA. This happens when the sodium resorption is happening, so we still have that negative lumen charge, but there's something wrong with the hydrogen ATPase pumping that hydrogen into the lumen. We already talked about how this is directly related to the bicarbonate production, so we're going to get an impaired amount of new bicarbs to replace that daily acid load. But because the sodium is reabsorbed in the principal cell, we do have the electrical gradient, which will attract the potassium into the lumen, leading to a potential hypokalemia. So characteristics of a classic distal RTA. Obviously the acidemia, it's a metabolic acidosis, and typically your urine pH will be higher because you're not pumping that excess hydrogen into the urine. And this typically will have a hypokalemia because of the potassium wasting that we talked about. This is one of the more common types of RTA that we see because there's all sorts of things that can cause this. Many, many medications, which you can find lists of online, multiple myeloma, pyelonephritis, sickle cell, various different toxins, even just critical illness sometimes can cause classic distal RTA. This leads us into our last type of renal tubal acidosis that we're going to talk about. This happens in a low aldosterone state where we have insufficient acid secretion. So to back up a little bit, we're going to talk about some physiology first. At a urine pH of 4.5, the hydrogen pump in the distal convoluted tubule is no longer able to pump more hydrogen into the lumen simply because of a concentration gradient. There's too much hydrogen and it can't pump against that. This is where ammonia comes in. Ammonia is produced in the proximal convoluted tubule and then it travels in the filtrate down into the nephron to the distal convoluted tubule, where it is able to bind excess hydrogen and become ammonium. This allows the concentration of free hydrogen to be favorable enough for the ATPase to be able to continue to pump free hydrogen into the lumen and keep the excretion of acid. Most of the acid that we excrete is bound, not free. In fact, if the daily acid load were all to be excreted as free hydrogen, we'd have to make over 250 liters of urine per day. And that simply comes down to the chemistry of the concentration gradients. So the ability to bind to ammonia and create ammonium is incredibly important to be able to excrete our acid. But in a low aldosterone state, we have hyperkalemia. That hyperkalemia directly inhibits ammonia production and transport. So it affects the enzymes that produce ammonia in the proximal convoluted tubule, and it also affects the transport proteins that help it get into the lumen and the distal tubule. The pathophysiology for the actual biochemistry of that is pretty complicated, but there have been studies that have shown that this is likely what's going on in this type of RTA. If we don't have enough ammonia that's either produced or able to get into the lumen, that means that we're not able to bind up extra of that hydrogen ion, meaning that we're not gonna be able to excrete it simply because the hydrogen pumps cannot excrete extra free hydrogen if the concentration is already too high of free hydrogen in the lumen. So key characteristics of this type of RTA is that you're gonna have an acidemia, but in general, it's gonna be milder than some of the other RTAs. The urine pH can be variable because there's a lot of other elements that factor into it in this type of RTA.
But a key characteristic that will distinguish this is that you will have hyperkalemia. This is one of the more common causes of RTA in the hospital, and it will always have hyperkalemia because that is the original pathophysiologic cause of what's going on. Quick note on the treatment of renal tubular acidosis. Like we talked about, there's all sorts of different causes of these RTAs, and so you really just need to treat the underlying cause to fix the RTA. If you have a case that is irreversible or idiopathic, like a genetic cause or something else that's due to damage that can't be reversed, the treatment is bicarbonate supplementation. This is a whole topic in nephrology, and it's very commonly done. You can give bicarbonate as tablets or even as baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate. And the baking soda method is actually really effective if you need a lot of bicarbonate. All right, quick summary table. A proximal RTA is due to loss of existing bicarbonate in the proximal convoluted tubule due to a failure to reabsorb the bicarb that is filtered. You typically will have a low plasma potassium. A distal RTA comes from impaired urine acidification, which is directly tied to bicarbonate production. So if you can't acidify your urine, you can't produce excess bicarb and therefore we have a metabolic acidosis. In classic distal RTA, you will be hypokalemic, but in voltage dependent, you'll be hyperkalemic. But it's important to know that classic is a lot more common. In a low aldosterone state, which is also known as a type four RTA, you have hyperkalemia, which is going to impair the production and transport of ammonia and ammonium in the lumen, which leads to an inefficient acid secretion because we need that ammonium to allow the concentration gradient of free hydrogen to keep the hydrogen pump continuing to pump out acid. In this state, you're going to have high potassium. Here are key references. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Decoding Physiology. I hope you learned some stuff. Please go back and watch through it. RTAs are some of the more confusing topics in medicine, but walking through the steps, we can understand it and make better decisions for our patients. We'll see you next time.